Section 19 of Astounding Stories 5, May 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 5, May 1930. Section 19. The Atom Smasher by Victor Rousseau. Chapters 7, 8, and 9. Chapter 7. Back to Long Island. Jim, seated beside Lucille, was listening to Kane's gruntings and chucklings as he expounded the situation to old Parrish. It was the day following the scene in the amphitheater. The four had been escorted back along the tongue of flooring into a hall with walls of fretted stone and sumptuous colorings. The floor was strewn with rich rugs woven of some vegetable fiber. There were divans and low chairs. At brief intervals, servitors, always smiling, passed carrying trays with wines and foods. And in the corridors were always glimpses of the guards. It was the rising of the full moon saved our lives, Dent, Parrish explained. It appears they have this sacrifice at each of the moon's phases. The victims, captives or criminals, are eaten by the priests. We've got a week's respite, Dent, and then... God help us. Jim's arm tightened about Lucille, but the girl turned and smiled into his face. There was no longer any fear there, and Jim swore to himself that he would yet find some way of outwitting their devilish captors. What the devil are we supposed to be? Criminals or what? he asked her father. Why do they smile at us all the time in that confounded way? Parrish questioned the Drilgo but apparently he was unable to explain himself to him. Maybe they think it an honor for us, Dent, he answered. Or maybe it's their idea of etiquette. Anyway, we four are to head the list when the moon's at the three quarters. God, if only we could reach the Atom Smasher. I'm certain I could find out how it works. Jim had tried more than once to reach it. Through the colonnades at the end of the hall he could see the mechanism standing on the platform, always being inspected by half a dozen or so of the dignitaries of Atlantis, but all his attempts to cross that tongue of flooring had been vetoed by the guards. They had presented their hands to him, palms outward, and on the palms were fine steel points about two inches long, set into leather gauntlets. It had been impossible to try conclusions with them. Two days went by. Once a group of dignitaries had entered the hall and, with smiles and profuse bows, inspected the prisoners. Then they had departed, and Jim had paced the floor, to and fro, thinking desperately. There was no sort of weapon with which to hazard an attack. Jim knew that they were under the closest observation. He could only wait and hope. And if all else failed, he meant to hurl himself, with Lucille in his arms, off the tongue of floor into the depths below when their time came. On the third morning, after a troubled sleep induced by very weariness, Jim was awakened by one of the guards, and started up to see one of the bowing dignitaries before him, and Parrish and Lucille sitting up among their rugs. Bowing repeatedly, the smiling old man addressed some words to Jim, and then turned to Parrish. He says he wants you to show him the way the Atom Smasher works, said Parrish. Now's our chance, Dent. He thinks it's simply an apparatus for neutralizing the blue-white ray. Don't let him guess. I won't let him guess, Jim answered. Tell him we'll go and show him. I've told him, and he says only you are to go. He's suspicious. Say something quickly, Dent. Tell him, said Jim, that I must have my two assistants and the lady. Tell him I may also need the help of some of his people. It requires many men to operate the machine. Parrish translated, speaking in the Drilgo tongue, which was their only means of communication. The Atlantean considered. Then he spoke again. He says that we three men may go, but Lucille must be left behind, groaned Parrish. The answer is no, said Jim. The old dignitary, who seemed somewhat crestfallen, departed with an expressive gesture. Jim and Parrish looked at each other. "'That's our end,' groaned Parrish. "'No, he'll bite,' answered Jim, with the first grin that had appeared on his countenance since their arrival. "'Let's make our plans quickly. We must contrive to get Lucille inside the machine 
under the pretense of assisting with the mechanism. And Kane, of course, he added, glancing at the goggly-eyed Drilgo. You do your best to locate the starting mechanism, Parrish, and signal me the moment you're ready. We'll both leap in, and the four of us will sail... God, I don't care where we sail to, so long as we get away from here. Into eternity, if need be. But I hope it's Long Island. Back came the dignitary with two of the guards. Smiling at Jim, he indicated by signs that the three others might accompany him. The Atlanteans had bitten, as Jim had forecast. The four proceeded along the hall and over the tongue of flooring. This time the force that had previously controlled their movements was not in action. At the farther end of the bridge they saw the group of dignitaries gathered about the Atom Smasher, examining it curiously. Over their heads the hooked arms of the hideous gods were raised. The eye was darkened, as if with a curtain, and through the glass roof, high overhead, the sunlight streamed down upon the empty amphitheater. In spite of their smiles, the dignitaries of Atlantis were very much on the alert, as their tense attitudes denoted. Two more guards had appeared, and Jim saw that they were uncovering some apparatus at the base of the eye. They were swinging a camera-like object toward him, its lens focused upon the Atom Smasher. It was not difficult to understand what was in the minds of the Atlanteans. The dignitaries were uneasy and mistrustful, and at the first suspicion of treachery they meant to loose the blue-white ray contained in the apparatus and blow the Atom Smasher and the group about it to destruction. Jim intercepted a sign from Parrish, indicating that he was to make pretense of assisting him. He bent over the machine, Lucille beside him. Parrish was busily examining the wheels and levers. He was adjusting the thumbscrews, moving the needles along the dials. One of the Atlanteans spoke, and Cain translated into Drilgo for Parrish's benefit. Parrish answered. Then, without raising his head, the old man said quietly, I've located the starting lever, Dent. You and Lucille get inside quickly and pretend you're doing something to the machinery. They stepped over the bow of the boat and stood beside Parrish, who continued examining the wheels. We mustn't forget Cain, whispered the girl to her father. Oh, I hope he understands. But there was no direct evidence that Cain did understand, and Parrish dared not warn him in Drilgo, for fear one of the Atlanteans might understand the language. Cain was standing close beside the boat, but he was not in the boat. Again one of the Atlanteans shot a question at Parrish. Parrish beckoned to Cain and awaited the translation. He answered. Each moment was growing tenser. It was impossible that the Atlanteans could fail to understand what was being planned. The only saving chance was that they did not realize the possibilities of escape that the vessel offered. A full minute went by. Suddenly Parrish raised his head. I've got it fixed, I think, Dent, he said. I'm going to count. When I reach three, seize Kane and pull him aboard. Jim nodded. The uneasiness was increasing. The guards at the camera-like object were each holding some sort of mechanical accessory in their hands. It looked like a small sphere of glass, and it connected with the apparatus by means of a hollow tube of fiber. Jim guessed that in an instant the ray could be made to dart out of the lens. It would be quick work, as nearly as possible instantaneous work. "'Ready, Dent?' asked Parrish in an even voice. In this crisis the old man had become astonishingly calm. He seemed the calmest of the lot. One. Jim beckoned to Kane, who came toward him, his eyes goggling in inquiry. Two. Jim reached out and took Kane by the arm. There was a sharp question from the Atlantean who had spoken before. Three. With all his force, Jim yanked Kane over the edge of the boat. The Drilgo stumbled and fell headlong with a howl of terror, but headlong inside. What happened was practically instantaneous. A sudden whir of the mechanism, a violet glow from the funnel, the smell of chlorine, a flash of blinding blue-white light. The Atlantean guards had fired. A quarter second too late. The thump, thump of the electrical discharge died away. The four were in the boat, whirling away through space. Kane was rising to his knees, a woe-begone expression on his face, and there was a clean cut with charred black edges along one side of the boat, showing how near the Atlanteans had come to success. The relief, 
after the hideous suspense of the past days, was almost too much for the three white people. "'We're free! We're going back home!' cried Jim exultantly, as he caught Lucille in his arms. And she surrendered her lips to his, while the tears streamed down her cheeks. Old Parrish, at the instrument board, looked up, smiling and chuckling. Even Kane, understanding that they were not to be hacked to bits with knives, gurgled and grinned all over his black face. "'How long will it take us to get back?' Jim asked Parrish after a while. "'I... I'm not quite sure, my boy,' the old man replied. "'You see, I haven't quite familiarized myself with the machine as yet.' "'But we'll get back all right?' asked Jim. "'Well, we... we're headed in the right direction,' answered Parrish. "'You see, my boy, it's rather an intricate table of logarithmic calculations that that scoundrel has pasted on this board.' The great danger appears to be that of coming within the orbit of the giant planet Jupiter. Of course, I'm trying to keep within the orbit of the Earth, but there is a danger of being deflected onto Pallas, Ceres, or one of the smaller asteroids, and finding ourselves upon a rock in space. Jim and Lucille looked at Parrish in consternation. But you don't have to leave the Earth, do you? Jim asked. "'Unfortunately, it's pretty hard sticking to the earth, my lad,' said Parrish. "'You see, earth has moved a good many million miles through space since the time of Atlantis.' But both Jim and Lucille noticed that Parrish was already speaking of Atlantis as if it was in the past. They drew a hopeful augury from that. And then there was nothing to do but resign themselves to that universal grayness, and to hope.' They noticed that Cain seemed to be watching Parrish's movements with unusual interest. The Neanderthal man seemed fascinated by the play of the dials, the whir of the wheels and gyroscopes. "'Are you setting a course, Dad?' asked Lucille presently. "'I mean, do you know just where we are?' "'To tell you the truth, my dear,' answered her father, "'I don't. I'm relying on some markings that Toda made on the chart, certain combinations of figures.' God only knows where they'll take us to. But I'm hoping that by following them we shall find ourselves back on Long Island in the year 1930. No, that rascal could hardly have written down those figures to no purpose. They seem to me to comprise a course, both going and returning. But the calculations are very intricate, especially in the time dimension. I've nearly reached the last row now. Then we shall have arrived, or we shan't. Jim and Lucille sat down again. There was nothing that they could do. But somehow, their hopes of reaching Long Island in the year of grace 1930 had grown exceedingly slim. Everything depended upon whether or not Tota had meant those figures to represent the course back to the starting point or not. A desperate hope, that was all that remained to them. They watched Parrish as his eyes wandered along the rows of figures, while his fingers moved the micrometer screws. And then he looked up. We're reaching the end of our course, he said. We're going to land somewhere. God knows where it will be. We must hope. That's all that's left us. His hands dropped from the dials. He pressed a lever. The blur of nights and days began to slow. A column of vivid violet light shot from the funnel. Grip tight, shouted Parrish. Thump! Thump! The atom smasher was vibrating violently. A jar threw Jim against Lucille. It was coming to a standstill. Trees appeared. Jim uttered a shout. He stepped across to Parrish and wrung his hand. He put his arms about Lucille and kissed her. They were back at the vanishing place, and all their sufferings seemed to be of the past. End of Chapter 7 Chapter 8 A Fruitless Journey Why don't you stop the boat, Parrish? I'm trying to, lad. The atom smasher was still vibrating, even more violently than before. A column of violet light was pouring from her funnel. The pool, the mud, the walls of heaped-up water were discernible, but all quivering and reproduced, line after line, to infinity. It was like looking into the rear-view mirror of a car that is vibrating rapidly. It was like one of those cubist paintings of a woman descending the stairs, where one had to puzzle out which is the woman and which is the stairs. A dreadful thought shot through Jim's mind. He remembered what he had said to Tota. You can't hold the boat still in four-dimensional space. This was not quite the same. 
By stopping the infernal mechanism, one re-entered three-dimensional space and landed. Certainly the Atom Smasher could land. They were not like the motorcyclist who got on a machine for the first time and rode to the admiration of all who saw him, except that he couldn't find out how to stop. Yet there was Parrish still fumbling with the controls, and the boat was still vibrating at a terrific rate of speed. It is impossible to dream of leaping out, for there was no solidity, no continuity in the scenery outside. It was not like attempting to leap from a moving train, for instance. In that case, one knows that there is solid earth beneath, however hard one lands. Here, everything was distorted, a sort of mirror reflection, and Jim noticed a strange thing that had never occurred to him before. Everything was reversed, as in a mirror picture. That clump of trees, for instance, which should have been on the right, was on the left. Parrish looked up. There's some means of stopping her, of course, he said. There must be a lever. But I don't know where to look for it in all this mess, he pointed to the revolving wheels. No, it might be a matter of days of experimenting in order to discover the elusive switch. It may be a combination of switches, said Parrish. I don't know what we're going to do. Suppose I jumped and chanced it, Jim suggested. Lucille caught his arm with a little cry. Parrish shook his head. That devil... Listen, there was a Drilgo he disliked. He threw him out of the boat just before she landed at the cave. Everything was in plain sight, plainer than things are here. But he was never seen again. For God's sake, lad, sit still. I'll try. Hours later, Parrish was still trying, and gradually Jim and Lucille had ceased to hope. Side by side they had sat, watching that glimmering scene about them. Sometimes everything receded into a blur, across which sunlight and shadow, and then moonlight raced. At others the surroundings were so clear that it almost seemed as if, by steadying the boat, they could leap ashore and once there happened something that sent a thrill of cold fear through both of them. For where the pool had been, there appeared suddenly a hut, and Tota, standing in the doorway, looking about him, a malicious sneer curving his lips. Jim leaped to his feet, and old Parrish, who had seen Tota too, sprang up in wild excitement. "'Sit down, lad!' he shouted. "'It's nothing. I—I I turned the micrometer screw a trifle hard.' I got us back to five years ago, when we were living here with Toda. That's just a picture out of the past, Jim. Jim understood, but he sank down again with cold sweat bathing his forehead. The terrific powers of the Atom Smasher were unveiling themselves more and more each moment. Jim felt Lucille's hand on his arm. He looked into her face. Jim, darling, what's going to happen to us if Dad can't find how to work the machine? I don't know, dear. I've thought that we might all jump out and chance it. If we held each other tight, we'd probably land in the same place. Old Parrish stood up. I can't work it, Jim, he said. Toda's got us beat. There's only one thing for us to do. You can guess what it is. I think I can, said Jim, glancing askance at Lucille. Yes, he knew, but he lacked the heart to tell her. If we were all to jump out, tied together... "'Don't you think we might land somewhere near where we want to land?' he asked. "'Jim, do you realize what each vibration of this boat means?' asked Parrish. "'There's a table on the instrument board. "'It's a wavelength of four thousand miles in space and nineteen years in time. "'You mean we're moving to London or San Francisco and back? "'Further than that, every infinite fraction of a second. answered Parrish. "'No, Jim, we... we wouldn't land.' So we must just go back to where we came from, and... He had been speaking in a low voice, calculated not to reach Lucille's ears. The girl had been leaning back, her eyes closed, as if half asleep. Now she rose and stepped up to her father and lover. You can tell me the truth, she said. I'm not afraid. We've got to go back, Lucille, answered her father. It's our only chance. By following the course in reverse, we can expect to make Atlantis again. Back to that horrible place? No, my dear. The chart will lead us, obviously, back to the cave where Toda has his headquarters. We must try to surprise him, and force him to bring us back to Long Island. And then? asked Lucille. Parrish shrugged his shoulders. 
We'll face that problem when we come to it, he answered. But how do you expect to be able to land at the other end any more than this? asked Jim. Suppose the machine continues to vibrate instead of coming to a standstill. I think, said Parrish, that we'll be able to strike a bargain with Tota. Obviously, he will be willing to bring the machine to a standstill in order to parley with us. We'll make terms, the best we can. After all, he can't afford to remain marooned on the Isle of Atlantis without the Atom Smasher. I hate the idea of bargaining with that wretch, said Lucille. So do we all, dear, answered Jim. But there's nothing else that we can do. It's just a matter of give and take, and I'd be glad to consent to any terms that would bring us three safe back to Earth with all this business behind us. I'll start back then, said Parrish, turning back to the instrument board. And, to the familiar thump, thump of the electrical discharge, the Atom Smasher took up its backward journey once more. A long time passed. With her head resting against Jim's breast, Lucille rested. Jim bent over her, trying to discover whether she was asleep or not. Her eyes were closed, her breathing so soft that she hardly seemed alive. An infinite pity for the girl filled Jim's heart and, mingled with it, the intense determination to overcome the madman who had subjected her to these perils. He glanced across at Parrish, fingering his screws. Old Parrish looked up and nodded. There was a new determination in the old man's face that made him a different person from the crazed old man whom Jim had encountered at the vanishing place. "'We can beat him, Parrish,' Jim called. And Parrish looked back and nodded again. "'We're nearly back to the top of the column,' he answered. Not long afterward, Parrish looked up once more. "'Stand by, Jim,' he called, "'and be ready. Toto will be aware of our approach by means of the sensitive instruments he keeps in his laboratory. But don't harm him. We want him aboard, and we want him badly. He won't be able to play any more tricks with us. I've learned too much about the Atom Smasher.' He pressed a lever, and the grayness dissolved into its component parts of light and darkness. A jar. Thump! thump. The violet light. Lucille looked up, raised herself, uttered a low cry, and caught at Jim's arm, trembling. They had run their course truly. The Atom Smasher was vibrating outside the entrance to Tota's cave. And that was Tota, standing there, watching them, that devilish grin of his accentuated to the utmost. A blurred figure that appeared and vanished, and a surrounding crowd of Drilgos, how many it was impossible to guess, for they looked like a crowd of apes in motion. Suddenly Tota disappeared, and a moment later Lucille uttered a terrified cry as his voice spoke in her ear. I thought you'd be back. I knew you'd got away from Atlantis when my recorder showed the waves of electrical energy proceeding from the city. You were clever, Dent, but you see, you had to come back to me to get my help. Don't be afraid, dear, said Jim, trying to soothe the girl. That's a wireless receiving apparatus. He pointed to a sort of cabinet enclosed among the rotating wheels, and then it was evident that Tota's voice was proceeding from it. Tota's figure appeared again, dancing through a haze of lines and patches. He was holding something in his hand which Jim made out to be the mouthpiece of a microphone. The voice inside the Atom Smasher spoke again. Turn all the micrometer screws until the needles register zero, Parrish. Then turn dial D to point three, dial C to five, dial B to one, and dial A to two. I'll repeat. Now press the starting lever, Parrish, and you'll find yourself on firm ground again. A few moments later, the Atom Smasher was pouring out an immense column of the violet light, and slowly the vibrations ceased. The blurred forms of Tota, of the Drilgos, grew clear. They had arrived. Tota stepped over the rail. And now, my friends, we'll have a talk, he said. No tricks, Tota, Jim warned him. You've probably got a number of devil trees up your sleeve. One or two, Dent, grinned Tota. We're willing to negotiate. Of course you are. You see, I hold the trumps, Dent. Those dial deflections, which are inevitable in the construction of any piece of mechanism, are not the same for Earth in 1920. Don't think you can use the same figures to land with. 
You must remember that there has been a precession of the equinoxes since the time of Atlantis, with a consequent shift in the Earth's axis. No, Dent, I've got you very much where I want you. But I'm willing to discuss terms with you. First of all, let's get rid of this useless cargo. I don't believe in overburdening a ship, he grinned. He picked up Kane bodily and heaved the astonished Drilgo over the side before he knew what was happening to him. Kane picked himself up and rubbed his sides, whimpering mournfully. The Drilgos crowded closer, their faces agape with astonishment. Tota spoke a command sharply, and they scattered. "'Before we come to terms, Dent, I'll give you a piece of news that may interest you,' said Tota. "'Much has happened during the time you've been away. Ambassadors have been out to see me from Atlantis. With the aid of a Drilgo interpreter, they conveyed to me that they have been greatly impressed by the disappearance of the Atom Smasher. They have nothing like it, of course, and they think I'm a number one magician. The upshot is, they want me to accept the supreme rule of the city, and use my arts to restore the lost territory that has sunk beneath the waves. They swore on an image of their god, Crook, that they were sincere. I told them that I'd sent the Atom Smasher away on a journey, but that it would be back shortly, and that I'd then give them their answer. Now, Dent, Tota's face took on that look of fanaticism that Jim had seen on it before, I'm going to repeat the proposition I made to you before. Join me. I'll make you my chief subordinate, and I'll load you and perish down with honors. Everything that a human being can desire shall be yours. And in a year or two, when we're tired of being gods, we'll take the Atom Smasher back to Earth and destroy it, and with our wealth we'll become the supreme rulers of Earth, too. I need you, Dent. You don't realize how lonely life can be when one is worshipped as a god. As for Lucille, there are a thousand maidens more beautiful than she is in Atlantis. Come, Dent, your answer. Your last chance, Dent. Don't throw it away. He read the answer before Jim could speak it. Jim saw Tota's face flicker and hurled himself upon him. Lucille screamed. The two men wrestled together in the narrow confines of the circular boat. Jim struck Tota a blow that sent him reeling against the rail. Then he felt himself seized from behind. A giant Drilgo had him in his arms. He lifted him over the side and flung him to the earth. In an instant, the chattering Drilgos were crowding down upon him. Struggling madly, Jim saw Tota fell old Parrish with a blow, push back Lucille as she sprang at him, and quickly press the starting lever. The column of violet fire faded. There came the whir of the mechanism. The Atom Smasher vanished. End of Chapter 8 Chapter 9 The Blinded Eye Jim fought with all his strength. He managed to shake off his assailants and regain his feet. Then one of the Drilgos poised his stone-tipped spear, ready to hurl it through his body. But the spear never left the Drilgo's hand in Jim's direction. Like a great black ape, Cain leaped upon the fellow and bore him to the ground. His feet twined around his shoulders, his hands gripping his throat. Not until the Drilgo had been reduced to a heaving, half-strangled hulk did Cain leave him. Then Cain, bending until his stomach almost touched the ground, came worming toward Jim, making signs of obeisance. What had happened that Jim had won the Drilgo's faith? Why did Cain now look upon him, apparently, as his master? It was impossible to gauge the processes of the black man's mind, and at the moment Jim was in no mood to wonder. The stunning disaster that had overtaken him monopolized his thoughts. Lucille and Parrish were once more in Tota's power. That was the dominating fact. The only gleam of comfort in the situation was that Tota had given him the clue to his movements. Beyond a doubt, Tota had taken his captives into Atlantis with him. It was impossible to disbelieve Tota's statement that he had been offered the supreme power in the city. Tota's egotism would have compelled him to blurt out that fact. Besides, Tota had certainly not gone back to Earth. Jim must force his way into Atlantis. He would find and rescue the two prisoners, or die there. He turned away from the groveling Cain and the chattering Drilgos, who, inspired by Cain's example, now seemed animated by the same instinct to obey him, and went into the cave. 
but at the entrance he turned for a moment and looked back. It was night. The valley was swathed in mists. The volcano opposite was spouting a shaft of lurid fire. On the water was a path of moonlight, where the clouds had been dispersed by the Atlanteans. Jim took in the scene. He raised one arm and shook his fist. Then, without a word, he passed inside. There was a soft light in the cave, streaming out from an inner chamber, access to which was through a narrow orifice in the rock. Jim passed through and found himself in Toto's laboratory. He was astonished at its completeness, still more so at the existence of numerous pieces of apparatus whose purpose it was difficult to understand. There was a radio transmitter and receiver, but improved out of all recognition from those in use in the prosaic year 1930. Three or four tiny dynamos, little more than toys in appearance, were generating as much voltage from the indicators as a modern power station, and overhead was a dial with two series of figures in black and red and two needles, both of which were swinging briskly, indicating that there was an intense electrical disturbance in the vicinity. The Atom Smasher! Jim took heart. Tota could not be far away. He looked about him, subconsciously trying to discover some implement that would prove of service to him. But there was nothing that he could see, not even one of the ray tubes. He looked about uneasily. Then his eyes fell upon something so singularly out of place that it looked, for the moment, like some prehistoric weapon. It was the last thing Jim would have expected to find there, nothing more nor less than a sporting rifle. Deer shooting had been one of Tota's pastimes in the old days, and more than one fat buck had been surreptitiously shot for the benefit of the larder at the vanishing place. There was something almost pathetic in the sight of that rifle and the fifty cartridges in their cardboard carton. Perhaps Tota had pictured himself shooting big game in Atlantis at some period or other. It was a human weakness that for an instant lessened Jim's hate and horror of the man. It brought him to a saner view of the situation. Jim had been on the point of losing his powers of reason. The sight of the rifle restored them. He turned sharply as he heard a sound in the entrance. Kane was coming toward him, with many genuflections and much stomach wriggling. He stopped, straightened himself. There was a look of singular intelligence on the Drilgo's face. He began chattering, pointing in the direction of Atlantis. Jim could make nothing of what he was trying to convey. Yes, they're there, he said bitterly, but I don't see how that's going to help me. Oh, my poor Lucille, said Kane unexpectedly. The words were like a parrot's speech, the intonation so remarkable a copy of old parishes that Jim was flabbergasted. Nevertheless, it was evident that Cain knew he was referring to Lucille. With a strange, slinking motion, he crossed the laboratory and bent beneath a huge slab of stone resting on two great hewn rocks. He emerged, holding in his arms two curious contrivances. He laid them at Jim's feet. Jim stared at them, and suddenly understood what they were. They were two pairs of wings, of the kind the Atlanteans had used when they made their aerial sortie against the Drilgos. Cain picked up one pair and began adjusting it about his body. He made fluttering movements with his arms. "'You mean that you've learned how to fly, you black imp of Satan?' shouted Jim. And Cain, as if understanding, nodded and beamed all over his black face. With that, Jim's idea was born. If the Drilgos would follow him, he would lead them against Atlantis, and, before the assault began, he would fly to the great eye that guarded it and blind it. He thought afterward that it was like a supernatural revelation, this scheme, that leaped full-fledged into his brain. And Cain had developed extraordinary executive ability. Outside the cave, through rifts in the swirls of fog, Jim could see innumerable Drilgos massing in the valley, as if they understood Jim's purpose. From Kane's gesticulations, and the number of times he rubbed his stomach, it was evident that he counted upon sacking Atlantis and was imagining innumerable meals of fat captives. Each flash of lurid light from the volcano disclosed further masses of Drilgos, armed with their stone spears, apparently assembling for the attack. Whether Tota had summoned them before the Atlanteans offered him the rulership of the city, or whether Jim's own plan had been communicated to them by some telepathic process, 
It was impossible to guess, but there was not the least doubt but that they were prepared to follow him. Cain nudged Jim and began strapping the other pair of wings about his body. Jim saw that the energy was supplied by two tiny lights burning in the base, cold fire, stored energy whose strength he did not guess. For, when Cain took him by the hand, and motioned to him to slide the knob in the groove, he was hurled skyward like a rocket. There followed a delirious hour. Tossing and tumbling like a pigeon in a gale, Jim by degrees acquired mastery over the apparatus. At the end of the hour he could fly almost as well as Cain, who, like a black guardian angel kept beside him, reaching out a hand when he overbalanced, and pulling him out of aerial side slips. Suddenly, Kane motioned toward the volcano and started toward it in a rocket-like swoop. Jim understood. The Drilgos were ready for the attack upon Atlantis. Jim dropped to earth, ran back into the cave, and picked up the rifle and the carton of ammunition. He filled the magazine and, with the rifle on his arm, rose into the air again. Kane was circling back, uttering weird cries of distress at finding his master absent. It's all right, Kane, said Jim. I'm here. Side by side, they flew steadily toward the base of the great cone, which was pouring out a fan-shaped stream of fire. Rumbling shook the earth. It was evident that another upheaval was in course of preparation. The long column of the Drilgos could be seen, extending around the flank of the mountain. Then, of a sudden, the eye opened, and across the causeway came the blue-white ray, carrying death and destruction. The Drilgos, who had learned wisdom, remained concealed out of the ray's path, and escaped, but a great dinosaur, fifty or sixty feet in length, startled by the light, came blundering out of the ferns, uttered a bellow, and melted into an amorphous mass. Birds dropped from their roosting places with a sound like that of falling hail. Black paths were cloven through the midst of the jungle. Rifle in hand, Jim soared into the air and shot forward, high above the causeway toward the glowing eye. He had noticed that the blue-white ray appeared in cycles of about two minutes and had made his plans accordingly. Two minutes in which to accomplish his task, or take the chance of a hideous death. Some thirty seconds carried him right into the glowing heart of the winking eye. He hovered and raised his rifle. Underneath him the breakers thundered. Round the eye a myriad seabirds fluttered, dashing themselves against it, falling into the waves. Huge and high the great city towered into the skies, lit by its soft incandescence. Jim could see the throngs in the streets, the traffic, but what was happening on the other side of the eye? Suddenly he saw the moon, in her third quarter, sailing through the skies, and a hideous fear overcame him. Suppose Tota had met with treachery, suppose that this very night Lucille were doomed to be sacrificed to the terrible god Kruk. Suppose that even at that moment her tender flesh were being sacrificed by the awful hooks. He drew a bead upon the eye and fired, and missed. The bullet went wide. But even if it struck, what guarantee had he that it would shatter the glass, or whatever substance it was that covered the orb? He lost position, and knew that the two-minute interval was drawing to a close. He soared and fired again. The eye still glowed. Then, of a sudden, a blinding ray shot forth from it, so dazzling that it seemed to sear Jim's eyeballs. The interval was ended. It shot beneath him, but no more than a few feet, and turning his eyes shoreward, Jim saw it sweep along the causeway and tear a black path through the forest. Frantically he soared and circled around the temple. The ray went out. Two minutes more. And now the temporary panic had passed, Jim's nerves grew steady as a rock. He eased the controls and floated in toward the glowing orb. Sea mews, screaming, dashed themselves against it and fell, wounded and broken, into the breaking seas below. They fluttered past Jim's face, one impacted against his chest with a thud that rocked him where he hovered. But Jim knew that he could not fail. At a distance of fifty feet, he drew a bead upon the center of the eye and pressed the trigger. And instantly... The light went out. End of chapter 9 Recorded by Allison Stewart Concord, California